Thank you. Um, that was a brilliant lecture. I have, uh, my, my mind is now so full of so many thoughts. Um, this, is a, this is a model of my life here. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with uh, a video which was made by Annika, and uh, there was an exhibition in uh, Amsterdam at the Arti at Amite, and um, this gives a, a little first feeling of uh, some of the rhythm section, if I have the right one. I need glasses. significance of uh, the kinesthetic relation between the senses in the visual arts, it's a mouthful. Uh, in, in essence, what I want to look at really is the fact that our culture is pre uh, predominantly driven by uh, visual imagery, the screen culture, our sense of reality is become increasingly bound to the screen. Uh, and I think the visual arts offer an alternative way of perceiving and uh, sensing the world really. So that's the, in summary, the gist of the lecture. Um, I will crack on with it. I was, I'm confused because I'm told to speak slowly, which is not my nature, but on the end, if I take uh, too long, the, the lecture gets longer, so uh, I'm going to go fast. Okay. Uh, our digital age is uh, culturally dominated by the power of the visual image. Through the medium of photography and the cinematic, there is a constant flow of imagery generated for personal, commercial, or political purposes. Uh, in this global flood of imagery, it is the iconic image which has the power to stand out from the flow and to hold attention. An iconic image has the power to embody a value system, an aspiration, or a belief, or to signify the portent of, a, of a, an event. The icon is also a focus for the devotional. Uh, this is a rather beautiful little image I found here in uh, Freising. It was in uh, one of the windows. Um, the iconic image originally was the preserve of the church. Um, it's associated with the divine uh, and the spiritual state of devotion. It, it has equally be, uh, been used and abused by those in power to validate or reinforce their status through the associative power of imagery. Um, the psychological power of the iconic image has migrated to the political world, and in our, sec uh, in our secular society, it has inexorably uh, become central to the success of the commercial world, uh, of advertising and, ent and, and, and uh, entertainment. The cult of appearance, and arguably uh, the cultural supremacy of appearance over content, has privileged the camera lens with an almost mystical sense of import uh, in the capacity of the camera to impart iconic signification uh, to the insignificant subject. Uh, Warhol uh, is uh, such a significant arti arti artist in this respect. You know, he predicted that uh, we would all have uh, five or 15 minutes of fame. The power of the lens is so persuasive that culturally it is ex it's, uh, accepted as the ultimate image of the real, even to the point where uh, people will say that uh, an experience is like a film, simulacrum, that the measure of reality by inversion is the degree to which it corresponds to the cultural filter of film. Uh, film has uh, inexorably become uh, a common visual cultural agreed norm of depicting the real. Um, our human vision is inexorably linked uh, to uh, uh, having two eyes, uh, by, it's binocular. And I think the, 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 the sense, we have been convinced in a way, by the very nature of watching so much film, that uh, that is how we perceive reality. But really, if you reflect on it, um, the nature of film and the camera, it's not how we see. We're kind of persuaded in some senses that uh, that is reality. I think on one simple level, um, when we look 
through our eyes. We have two eyes. We have binocular vision. Uh, our point of focus is very small. When we look at a photograph, everything is in photograph, is in a focus. But in reality, uh, when you look at the world through your own eyes, you're really, you've only got a very small point of consciousness which moves through space. Um, so when we look at the world, really we scan the world, but in essence uh, we're viewing the world through a constant movement of our eyes. It's a, a, a constant movement. Okay, I need to... Um, the reduced depth of field in an image more closely corresponds both to the optical and spatial and emotional relationship we have to reading a subject. Uh, effectively, the value of the photograph is that prior to any creative mediation or editing in post-production, the camera, the camera simply replicates the optical appearance, no more or less. It's a kind of a cast of the subject. Um, like a death mask, it holds the fascination of being in contact with the subject and in being a faithful uh, replica. Its emotional charge is that we are subjected to a trope akin to visiting uh, Madame Tussauds. Um, the, the very similitude of the image generates the frisson of mistaken reality. It is an illusion of semblance, but it is fundamentally dead, lacking the animation which we associate with the vital living presence. On both a conceptual and an emotional level, photography gives a heightened sense of the distance between the then of the imprint of the image and the now of viewing. Paradoxically, the presence of the image induces an acute sense of the absence of the subject, inducing either a feeling of uh, nostalgia or pain in the sense of the loss of the subject. Viewing the image asserts the untouchable and the irretrievable, and the irretrievable nature of the absent subject. The photograph generates an acute sense of appearance, but equally the sense of the impossibility of trying to communicate through an impenetrable distance of time and space. Photography also amplifies an uncomfortable sense of being uh, a consuming voyeur. Uh, and in this sense, all photography tends to the state of pornography, one could argue. Uh, the dead mechanical imprint of the image amplifies the difference between a mechanized replication of appearance and memory, which is articulated by the performative action of making a drawing or painting. Uh, okay. However, while the photographic image uh, on one level is a dead mechanical cast, there is a vital human connection via the empathetic projection of our human imagination, which uh, connects us via uh, the images kind of, yeah, very similitude to the subject. And the subsequent connection is also gener generated in reading the empathetic projection of the photographer. The miracle of photography is that while it is uh, a detached mechanical process, it is also in common with all other visual art forms capable of carrying intention. The mechanical image will carry the indexical narrative of the subject and also carry the meta-narrative of the artist uh, photographer's vision expressed by the intentions made visible in the composition of the photograph or other interventions in the process. The, the perceived intentionality subsequently reveals not just the relation to the subject, uh, but the artist's wider view of the world. In this sense, every art form is subject to the intentionality of the maker, and it is the enactment of this intentionality which constitutes the real cultural content of the artwork. In this, uh, it is this intentionality which redeems and humanizes the otherwise mechanical detachment of the photograph. Um, okay, move on. Um, the photographic and cinematic forms of communication are essentially variations of forms of realism. It's my concern here to look at other kinesthetic modes of visual expression, and in particular the relationship between the concrete, uh, the concrete nature of art, materiality, body, touch, rhythm, and the poetic impulse within the construction of embodied artworks rather than image-based realism. <clears throat> my pardon. To come back to the title of the essay, the term kinesthetic essentially refers to the relationship between the movement, uh, between movement and the senses, the etymology of the word being kinetic of movement and aesthetic of the senses. The kinesthetic sense detach, uh, detects body position, weight, movement of the muscles, tendons, and joints. Kinesthetic intelligence is using the body to create or to do something. Uh, it is to make art. Psychologically, our reading of space is, uh, is generated by two distinctly different modes of perception, um, which are articulated by uh, 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 
man called Anton Ehrenswig in a publication called The Hidden Order of Art. Uh, much of this essay uh, is in debt to him. One mode is scanning, in which we have the awareness of the whole field of vision, noticing changes of edges of movement in the field. Uh, when we are moving through a space, we rely on this unconscious or semi-conscious uh, scanning process. It is essentially a survival mechanism, but it also has profound aesthetic significance, as scanning uh, allows us to sense the complex visual relationships in our field of vision, sensing both the harmonies, the contrast, the connecting rhythms within the field. Uh, in this process of forming a composition, the artist will actively uh, alternate between scanning and analytical modes of vision. Um, you see artists doing that, they will squint to reduce the details so as to get a sense of the overall relationship of the parts and then focusing a high level of attention on some detail. The viewer also uses uh, both these modes of vision uh, in the sense that they have to scan the work, they have to sense the relationship of the parts, and also then to kind of take, uh, uh, take their mind into the space of the work and actually have an attention to the details that are in the work. Um, okay. Come back there. The second mode of, uh, of, of looking is uh, conscious analytical. And there is a distinct difference between scanning and uh, analytical modes of, of, of looking. Uh, in this drawing here, it's really, you can see it's really the process of just following the kind of line that, of the mind as it traces its way through the space. Yeah. This, this, this kind of the, the conscious analytical directed looking is where we direct our gaze to small point of focus, which in reality is like passing a small lens of high focus of consciousness over the subject, and that is through time and space. Drawing takes time. The camera, uh, in large part, it's a kind of a single moment, but our looking moves through time and space, and the drawing records this. In this sense, the protracted time-based activity of drawing and painting from observation much more accurately corresponds to and is subsequently a more accurate record of how we actively direct our gaze through both a spatial terrain and through time. Um, there is a third way of looking which is called syncretistic. Uh, given our common beginnings as children, there is an, uh, an essential and universal childhood tendency towards a syncretistic shorthand. Um, this is a work by uh, Bryce Marden. I'll move on from there, my apologies. Um, Okay. Syncretistic is a kind of shorthand for visually describing experience. Uh, our visual skill in childhood is to articulate the essentials through a holistic, a, a holistic perception of experience. Um, the combined, uh, this combines different forms of visual communication, including schematic representation to tell a story, a kind of simplified mapping of the space, uh, exaggerating form according to an emotional sense of what is most important or significant in the subject. Uh, and this is all compounded by an essential delight in the physical material nature of the medium. I think early and uh, non-Western cultures adopt and use these non-realistic syncretistic modes of, of description as, uh, as from a visual communication point of view, they are more effectively able to communicate the psychological understanding rather than just the optical appearance of reality. It is these uh, syncretistic qualities of non-Western culture and children's art which uh, prompted Picasso to exclaim that uh, while he could draw like Raphael by the time he was 14, uh, for the rest of his life he was trying to draw like a child. Child. I think what he meant by that was trying to re re reconstitute the syncretistic vision. Um, I have some uh, Picasso drawings here. Um, also, one of the features of uh, children's drawings, which I think is a major part of uh, the drawing process, is that they will enact so that the drawing is not just what a thing looks like. In some sense, they will performatively reenact it. I was very struck by this. Uh, at one time, I had the pleasure of working with young children drawing, uh, teaching some of them. And uh, I was astonished at how, when they made the mark, they were almost reconstituting the movement, the very nature of the thing itself, not just its appearance. And I think this is something which is inherent to, the, to a large extent to us when we're children. So the, the syncretistic, it's interesting, the performative relationship, this is Picasso's drawings uh, for, for Guernica. Um, it's interesting, his relationship to the horse, that uh, the horse has almost become like a dancer. Um, 
and the, the kind of distortion the sense in the sense of grief the kind of falling back of the figure so in this sense the drawing it's uh, really enacting not just uh, the visual appearance but the very the very the very body sense of uh, of a subject. These drawings here also from Picasso are quite extraordinary. I think the, the sense of trying to articulate the, uh, the feeling of crying, um, they're an amazingly inventive set of drawings. So they're combining really uh, a kind of a performative enactment in some way. Uh, they're very much about the senses, the sense of crying, the sense of screaming, the sense of the actions of the muscles in the head. This is a, a Rembrandt drawing which I take great pleasure in. It's a, an extraordinary drawing. It's, the, it's really looking via the imagination and also looking through, a body, through one's own body memory. The sense of shock that Rembrandt would have had in seeing this creature. Uh, the mark making, it's really uh, such an exquisite articulation of the mass of the creature. But it relies largely on a degree of empathy. I think when we look at anything, we're projecting our body memory. There is a profound level of empathy in the process of reading any form. Uh, again in this drawing here, a kind of sense of the kinesthetic. It's very, it's very powerful in this drawing of uh, this man. He is uh, reaching into his pocket and you can sense um, all the kind of movements that are going on as he reaches into his pocket, the shoulder comes up, the other hand comes up, uh, even the sense of his consciousness. It is staggering the degree of uh, complexity of reality which it is possible to convey just through the action of a mark in space. Uh, from, a from, from a phenomenological perspective, human vision and the assimilation of visual information is subject to the complexity of exchange between vision and the other senses. In developmental terms, it's understood that uh, in our fetal state, the separation of the senses is very minimal. That at an early neurological stage, there is a synesthetic connection between the senses. In later development, uh, some of this synesthetic sense remains. Even outside of the extremes of having a synesthetic correspondence between the senses, there remains for all of us an acute connection uh, and exchange between the senses. We navigate the world through a seamless flow between the senses, uh, an exchange between the senses, uh, between the sense of sound, touch, tactile stimuli. I think we often underestimate the degree to which the senses work in relation to our perception of space. We tend to think of perception of space being predominantly linked to our visual perception. However, our perception of space is as much uh, auditory as it is visual. We can acutely sense the scale of a space through the way the sound travels and reverberates through the building. We hear and feel the scale of a cathedral just as we can sense the confines of a small room uh, just through the sense of sound. It's interesting if you shut off sound, uh, how the kind of spatial sense of the world starts to collapse. This is a, a work by Henry van der Hoog. Uh, what is really a, an interesting energy, just as you had in the uh, previous image of uh, the Rembrandt, there is a kind of kinesthetic sense of the weight and the movement of the form, but also you have this constant dynamic between positive and negative energy. Uh, that sense of the very first mark you put onto a sheet of paper is the fifth mark. As soon as you place a mark, it, it's really in relation to the, the whole format. It's interesting from a just out point of view, we can either, we're supposed to, from a psychological point of view, be only able to follow a positive form. And uh, Henriette, when she was discussing this work with me, saying there is no negative forms here. Uh, that, that normally in just out it's either positive or negative. But here you have this perfect tension between positive and negative. It's really a, po a tension between positive forms. Uh, again, I'm using some examples here from the exhibition. Again, you have this kind of tensile relationship between positive and negative space, where the negative space is forced to become positive in this work. Um, okay, my apologies. I'm just finding my way through my paper. Um, I was thinking 
to move into uh, uh, some sense of our relationship to the picture plane. The picture plane is simultaneously a surface, it's a palimpsest which records performative gestures and the overlaying of actions through time. The picture plane is also perceived, of, uh, perceived as a depth of space akin to a stage in which we project or, uh, and read spatial activity. These visual traces can be read as the residue of a mental and physical performance like the traces of a dance. The picture plane doubles as a spatial field of light and color while simultaneously being a tension of pigmented shapes across a flat surface. All this visual complexity is then subject to the imaginative projection and personal associations of both the artist and the viewer. Um, this is a work by Alison. The previous work was by Alexei. Um, I want to say something a little bit here about the significance of touch. Uh, we talk about being touched by a subject, uh, the touch of reason, being touched by madness, uh, or light touching a surface. Touching forms both a physical and psychological connection. In art, we are conscious of the touch of the hand, uh, we're t conscious of the touch in music. Uh, in a way, the artist manipulates materials um, through the touch, or or from a note of color. Touch performatively expresses and forms a record of an emotional and conceptual response. Objects that have been touched carry a residue of connection. Given the choice between a, a photographic image and an actual object taken from the event, most of us would probably choose uh, the object as carrying more residual significance. Uh, these objects function as relics. The object relic affords uh, uh, some form of physical, visceral, or emotional connection to the event, effectively bridging and connecting us rather than amplifying uh, the separating distance of space and time. We're able to touch the event. This, I would argue, is the primary difference between the plastic arts and the photographic image. The plastic arts uh, transcend the replication of appearance and, and give experience form, becoming a performative embodiment of the mental and visceral relationship to the subject. Repetition uh, and the relation between chance and order. Repetition by its very nature creates rhythm. Uh, this is a rather wonderful drawing here. A simple example is to create a random pattern. As soon as it is, as soon as, as it is replicated and overlaid or juxtaposed, you have created, uh, you have created a repeating rhythm. The repetition sets in motion the intellectual engagement with uh, visual structure and uh, the recognition of pattern, as the mind recognizes the relationship between the same and different structures. Rhythm engages the analytical mind, seeking pattern and structure in the flow of stimuli. The intellectual skill is a, this, this intellectual skill is a kind of vital intelligence, um, a vital tool of survival, which is endlessly rehearsed and reenacted through gaming and creative play. There is within rhythm a certain predictable, uh, readable structure, but within a creative rhythm, there is always variation and permutation. <coughs> um. Creative rhythm, in this sense, is the vehicle and celebration of the human mind's capacity for improvisation. Improvisation allows change and development, which is again a vital necessity. The aesthetic pleasure is in the appreciation of variation and permutation within the evolution of a composition. Aesthetic pleasure is dependent on elements being continuous. A certain continuum is required to appreciate the nuance of variation and the development in the work. Rhythm requires variation within repetition, thematic continuum of a structure evolving through permutational possibilities. Okay, we're coming to an end here, guys. There is a vital difference between mechanical, regular, and dynamic aesthetic rhythm. Rhythm in this sense is the expression of both intellect and body, of coordinated, collaborative, and synergistic will. There is, uh, this is expressed most vividly through the rhythmic difference between mechanical beat of uh, marching and the variation and uh, improvisation of dance. Marching implies a collective cause uh, and a subjugation of the individual to the collective purpose. The individual, in abnegation of their, of their autonomy, becomes a component part of a larger force and reciprocates through the aggrandizement of their individual anonymity by being an agent of this greater force. The individual then becomes intoxicated, empowered as the vehicle of a collective power. Uh, this is in complete contrast to uh, the kind of creative energy of rhythm. In contrast, creative rhythm implies a willing, responsive, cooperative agreement in a state of open exchange rather than imposed mechanical repetition. 
It is, an, it is an agreement of consensual play, a conversation which will lead to unexpected creative outcomes. Rhythm generates a sense of imminence, of transformation and progression from one living dynamic state to another. And, in, and it is this distinctive uh, feature of rhythm. This is uh, the preeminent expression, the most vital, I think, force in the arts. Okay, my apologies for a rather long and tedious lecture.